I want to share with you today some resurrection realities, resurrection realities. The truth is that if the resurrection is real, and I believe with all of my heart, and I know that it is, my Savior lives, and the best reason I know that is because of what he's done on the inside of me. There's all kinds of biblical and extra biblical uh, sources of ways we document that, and if you're interested in those, if you're more of a skeptic like I tend to be sometimes and have tended throughout my life to be, in your sermon notes, good plug for our Black Hawk Church app as well as our website, in the sermon notes, there's a link right under this title where you can click and watch a sermon that I gave back in October of last year when we were going through what we believe, and it was on the resurrection of Christ. And we give a lot of verifiable evidence, both from Scripture and then outside of Scripture, of how we believe and know that Jesus is risen. But here's the the premise of today's message, that if the resurrection is real, then there are some inescapable realities uh, that I am faced with. I'm faced with eternity. I'm faced with sin. But is, is even more I'm faced as we look at Jesus today in John 20. If you have your Bibles, meet me there. Devices, wherever you're at, we'll have it on the screen for you as well. In John 20, we're met with the reality of who God is, of his character, of his attributes, of who God truly is at the core. And I'm so thankful to know a God. And one of those realities that we've got to begin with today is the reality of how God sees death and how God sees resurrection. I can remember growing up oftentimes struggling with whether it was pastors, people at funerals, saying things like, well, you know, death, Kevin, is just a natural, normal part of life. And I struggled with that. So I thought about, well, if God really loves us, then why would he let death be such a horrible part of this life? And the more I've come to know Jesus, the more I've followed Jesus, the more I realize to us, in our earthly sense, we see death as natural and resurrection as unnatural, right? Not if you agree. If, if someone walked out of the nearest grave and came in here, you would think that's pretty unnatural, a little creepy even, right? It feels so unnatural. But what I've learned about God is that he never intended for death to be a part of his plan to begin with. So to God, death is unnatural and resurrection is natural. God is a God of life. He creates life. He gives life. And even though sin has marred creation and we temporarily deal with death, I am so thankful that my sins, past, present, and future, were dealt with and nailed to the cross. My debt was canceled because of the price that Jesus paid fully, freely, and forever. And that we serve a God who sees resurrection as natural. Resurrection is who he is, and death is something that he's already defeated. Did you know death is already defeated? He's already won the battle. We live in the temporary feelings of that today, but he has won that victory. Because with Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, write this down, here's what it is. It's the death of death. He conquered, he killed death once and for all. And one day we'll see him face to face and be with him forever. And so you may say, well, you know, what is it about Christianity that's so different? Well, one of those is resurrection. Two distinctives of Christianity, I have to say, number one is resurrection. There are millions and millions of people who go and visit the founder of various religions. They visit their tomb. Well, the tomb of Jesus is empty. We look at the emptiness and say, we don't look there to commemorate our Jesus. We look up above because he's seated at the right hand of God. He's the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. So the resurrection is, is so, so key to everything. It's the hinge of our faith. Secondly is grace. Grace. Every other religion in the entire world will have something to do with you achieving and earning and attaining salvation. But I'm saved by grace through faith, not of works. That means I can't be good enough but that Jesus, because he conquered death after being the perfect sacrifice for me, living the sinless life I could never live, he resurrected, rose from the dead, and he gives me undeserved grace. I get his mercy, which means I don't get what I do deserve. You ever given that out as parents? You ever had that given out? But I also get his grace, which is getting everything I don't deserve. And I'm glad I serve that kind of a guy. And with that foundation, I want us to look at some resurrection realities. So let me ask you a question. What would you do if you had just accomplished this, these key distinctives of Christianity? You've given your grace, you've poured out your blood, you have conquered death. What would you do on the day of your resurrection? For me, I would probably find a hammock. I'd probably take me a nap. But not my Jesus. Not my Jesus. You know what he does? He goes and he meets meets with and pursues people right where they are. People who are grieving and were confused, just like perhaps you are 
today. And so I want to give you a picture of three different groups of people, how they were dealing with pain and with grief, how they were dealing with the sorrow of losing Jesus today. Three resurrection realities. And number one comes from John 20, verses 11 through 18, is that Jesus heals pain. Jesus heals pain. John chapter 20, the first 10 verses, if you want a devotion for your week this week, I'm skipping to verse 11 here, but it's when Mary Magdalene and the disciples, they were at the tomb and they had seen that the grave clothes, the linens, some hundred plus pounds of spices and linens that would be wrapped around him, they were caved in and he was not there. They had discovered that the disciples have just gone home, but in that passage, I dare you to find there's three times John wrote this gospel, the gospel of John, he calls himself, he speaks of himself in the third person, says the one whom Jesus loved, the disciple whom Jesus loved, or in this case, the other disciple. And I love the humanity and even the humor that we find in scripture. And so I dare you to find these three things, John chapter 20, verses one through 10, where he says three different ways, the disciple whom Jesus loved outran Peter to the tomb. The, disciple, the other disciple who got to the tomb first, he wanted all of his readers to know that he got there first, that he won the foot race. But after that foot race, the disciples have gone back home. But Mary, Mary Magdalene, her last name is not Magdalene, just so you know. She's from Magdala, but we know her as Mary Magdalene. She, think about who she is. She has watched Jesus cast seven demons out of her. He has brought healing and transformation and love into her life like nothing and no one has ever done before. But now they don't see him in the tomb, but they're being accused of stealing the body. They wonder, did he really raise from the dead? Is that really what he meant or did he mean something different? Can I really believe this? Are they going to arrest me? They just murdered him. Are they going to murder me too? Can you imagine what was going through their minds? She had a lot of pain. She was grieving and we all grieve in different ways. So let's see how Mary grieved. She was at the tomb. Verse 11, we'll read through verse 18. I ask you again, are you ready for the word, Black Hawk? It's going to change you. Are you ready for it? Verse 11, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, we missed that one a little, didn't we? She said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. I'll come back to that in a minute. Verse 16, Jesus said to her, Mary, love this part, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. Verse 17, Jesus said to her, do not cling to me for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers. This is to the disciples, those who had gone home. And say to them, I am ascending to my Father, don't miss this, to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. You see, Jesus had made a way for us to all be family. We're all one in Jesus' name. Verse 18, Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. Let's say that together because that's what we're here to declare today. I have seen the Lord. And that he had said these things to her. Jesus heals pain. And what we see the story starting with in verse 11 is weeping, is, is grieving. And what I've learned about Jewish culture, both today, but especially back in Mary's time, is that grieving, I've been a part of a lot of funerals here, and we tend in our westernized culture to repress our grief. We kind of bottle it up. And if you, not if you can know what I'm talking about, because that's how you are maybe as a person. You're going to be able to relate to all these different people. We tend to repress grief, but they would express grief very openly. They would stop all work. They would stop everything that they're doing. And that's what Mary's doing. But don't miss the concept that she teaches us about. The disciples, they had all gone home. And even though she was feeling pain and bewilderment and confusion, here's what she does. She just sits still and waits on Jesus to show up. That's a pretty good word for us if you're going through a time of pain and bewilderment. Is be still in the presence of God and wait and watch for Jesus to show up. But seek him. 
but look for him. And that's exactly what she was doing. She was confused, didn't know if it was a body, didn't know if he was going to walk in. And then we see that Jesus did just that. And she finds these two angels, these two dressed in white. Typically, you dress in black. Grieving was a serious thing, and you dress in black. But she sees them in white, and they're sitting at the head and the feet of Jesus. And they say, why are you weeping? What's the problem? And you would think, you know, my sarcastic giftedness that I have, I'd say, what does it look like I'm doing? Right? But she just is in awe of what she's seeing. She's confused, and they meet her there. And I love what happens next when Jesus shows up. Did you know that this is the first time that Jesus presented himself to anyone after the resurrection? And it was to Mary Magdalene, to a female. Let me pause and tell you, you know, today we don't look at things quite the same as they did back then. But in this day and time, listen, if you were going to try to create a believable narrative that Jesus raised from the dead. Like, let's just say it's not true for a minute, that the disciples stole his body. I want you to know the last thing you would do is record the revealing of Jesus as first happening to a female. Why? Because females during this time, women's testimonies would not be upheld in court. Women's testimonies would not be believed even among people in the general day and time. And so this is such verifiable evidence that the resurrection is real, even in and of itself. I'm not going to preach that sermon. I told you I already preached it. That's for a different day. You can go and listen to it. But wow, what a picture of how the facts are just recorded. Jesus first revealed himself to a woman. Verse 18, she became Mary Magdalene, became the first reporter of the reality of the resurrection to the disciples and to the rest of the world, that she had seen Jesus. I love that picture, but don't miss what happens. He asked her a question. She thought he was the gardener. Kind of missed that. You say, well, how, do you, how do you miss that? I don't know. I wasn't there. But what I do know is that Jesus did one simple thing that changed everything. He called Mary by name. He said, Mary, Mary. And when he called her by name, she uses this term, rabbi. And rabbi would be more of a formal teacher kind of term, but this means more like my teacher. It's a personalized version. My teacher, my Jesus. She knew who he was. And Jesus started a healing process of the pains that she went through because he showed up in the most unconventional of ways. Aren't you glad Jesus shows up even though it may be in unconventional ways? Well, are you looking for him? Are you looking for his healing? Pursue him. He will pursue you. He's already there. He loves you and cares for you so much. Jesus heals pain. Let's go to the second group here. And the second thing that we see, the next resurrection reality is that Jesus cuts through fear. Jesus cuts through fear. Now, the disciples, as Mary goes back and tells them, this is the next group, these are the disciples, so they dealt with their grief in a different way. They kind of had a group therapy time. This is the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. They're probably having some, t- some semblance of church, kind of their small group. This is their life group time. If you don't have a life group, you need one. And they were already demonstrating this life group thing. And they grieved and worked through their pain and their fear by getting together in a room. But they were behind a locked door. And Jesus cut through their fear, literally, spiritually, emotionally, mentally, and in every way possible. Let's look at verses 19 through 23 as they're afraid. Now, you've got to understand now, they're afraid of the Jews because their leader has just been murdered, brutally murdered. And they're being accused of what we would equate to a federal crime of stealing the body. And I don't know how that could happen considering that the stone that was rolled in the way most scholars estimate conservatively would be a ton and a half to two tons. I mean, not even 20 people could move it. I mean, the Roman government really worked hard to make sure that tomb was secured, placed soldiers there. But yet nonetheless, they were accused, and so they were afraid. So verse 19 of John chapter 20. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked, that's what fear does. It locks you up in a prison. The doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, peace, shalom, peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were glad, I'm sure, when they saw the Lord. Verse 21, Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. And as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. Verse 22, and when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold the forgiveness from any, it is withheld. And we'll go through each of these verses and I'll unpack some of those things. But let's start at the beginning there, starting in verse 19. As Jesus shows up, he has a way of showing up, doesn't he? 
And I want to give you from how Jesus shows up three things here, three reasons you can trust Jesus with whatever you're afraid of. Number one is God's peace. Verses 19 and 20, Jesus says, peace be with you three times. We just read two of them. There's one more to come. It's God's peace. This is a reason you can trust God with whatever it is that grips you in your fear. Jesus cuts through fear, and God's peace shows up. He says, shalom. And here's I used to think when I thought of peace, I used to think that peace was a place that I would get to. You know, if I get relationships in a good spot, if my bank account looks a certain way, or, you know, maybe you think, well, if I get this marriage, if I get that good-looking gal, or I marry the handsome guy, then I'll arrive, I'll be at peace. A lot of times we think peace is this place that we find, but the more I've gotten to know Jesus, I've realized that Jesus is peace personified, that instead of peace being a place that I find, peace is a person that I trust. And I love that Jesus says, peace be with you. It's a little bit of sarcastic irony in what he's saying. He's saying, peace be with you. And literally, physically, peace was with them because Jesus was with them. Peace had entered the room and peace was with them. We have God's peace and it gives us a reason to trust Jesus through our fear. Verse 21 gives us the second one, not just God's peace, but God's purpose. God's purpose, another reason you can trust Jesus with whatever it is that you are fearful of. In verse 21, Jesus says, as the Father sent me, I'm sending you. And look at me for a minute. Did you know, if you're a follower of Jesus, a lot of times we think, you know, we have pastors, they do the work of ministry, but according to Scripture, don't miss this, if you are a follower of Jesus, you claim to be a Christian, you have given your life to Jesus, and you are a follower, a disciple of his, then guess what? You are called into full-time Christian ministry. Ministry is for all of us. My call as an under-shepherd in God's church and our elders, pastors, deacons, and leaders here is just to equip the saints for the work of the ministry so that we together follow the lead of Jesus, follow the formula of Jesus, that we have a purpose. If you came today hoping you could find peace, hoping you could find purpose in your life, I declare in Jesus' name, you have found it because you have found Jesus. And no matter what skeletons are in your closet, Jesus has called you with a purpose, and he sends us just like he sent his disciples. And I think fear is one of the greatest inhibitors of calling and purpose in our life. We let fear get in the way so many times. Well, what if I fail? Or what if I don't have what it takes? If, you, if you're there, join us starting next week. We're going to do a series called Inadequate Me, looking at the life of Gideon. I'll tell you more later. But we'll look at how God has done that throughout history with purpose. What Jesus did, though, is he cut through their greatest fear to point them to their greatest purpose. And that is exactly what God wants to do in your life and mine. The third thing, not just God's peace, God's purpose. Number three is God's presence. I sure am glad I can know who Jesus is, but that I can know him personally as Mary even depicted. Verses 22 and 23. I love verse 22. He says, it says that he breathed on them. And hold on a second. I want you to do an exercise with me, Easter exercise. You ready for this? I want you just to take a deep breath. Not very COVID friendly, but super spiritually healthy. You ready? Deep breath. Now let it out. That was so good. Let's do it again. One more time. God wants you today to rest in the reality of the resurrection. Some of you have come, some of you are watching, and you haven't rested in a long, long time. I love that it says Jesus breathed on them. And then he says, receive the Holy Spirit. And that is the presence of God that indwells us. His presence goes with us, goes before us, and is inside of us. That's why church is not about a building anymore. It's about a body that goes out. Raise your hand if you're the church. We do this exercise often. If you're a believer, you're the church. It's not these buildings. We gather in buildings, but we are the church. And I can imagine that Jesus didn't say, receive the Holy Spirit loud, like, receive the Holy Spirit. No, I believe that as he breathed on them, he let them know that he was close, that he was near. And he said, receive the Holy Spirit presence of Almighty God. How do I know this? He had already told the disciples before this. John chapter 16 and verse 7, Jesus said this to the disciples. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. They were like, no, don't leave us. And he said, no, it's, it's good that I do, that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. 
And then we come to verse 23, and it's the power of God's forgiveness. And I thank God for this verse when it comes to his presence, that he showed up when I needed him the most and gave us forgiveness. Verse 23 trips a lot of people up because it's like, well, it says that we forgive sins, right? And if you withhold forgiveness, then it's going to be withheld. I thought only God could forgive sins. Absolutely, that's true throughout Scripture. you got to read into the context of the purpose and the presence of God, what we see God doing. And don't miss this. This is so beautiful that Jesus has given them a purpose. He said, as the Father sent me, I'm sending you. And he's saying that the forgiveness of sins, I've won the battle. I'm the authority on forgiving sins. He had been beaten and crucified for saying that very thing and demonstrating that very thing. Now he's saying, now I send you. You get to be agents. You get to be ambassadors of that forgiveness. And as my church, I am building my church, Jesus would say and had said. And even the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He says, now go. First Peter chapter 4 calls us stewards. A steward is a manager of something that doesn't belong to me. A steward of God's grace. Now we get to go out and be agents and ambassadors of the grace and the forgiveness and the love of God in verse 23. But some of you don't believe that. Some of you don't think you could be forgiven. So this is my Easter illustration for you. And if you've got a piece of paper, an extra one, you can grab it. If you're at home watching on the screen, grab you one. You can participate in this with me if you'd like. Uh, but you can also just remember what it looks like. This is you and this is your sin. Uh, you were pretty clean until sin ent entered the world. And how many of you had to really work hard to learn how to sin? Yeah, exactly. Right. And this happened. Sin came in, and we know that we all fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, and it just crumbles us up. I'm just going to squeeze it. Where's Coach Davidson when you need him? Way to go, boys, by the way. Winning state championship. Yeah. Blackhawk Braves, got to get my plug in, but as great as that victory was, the one I'm about to describe is going to blow you away even more. You ready? This is your sin, and you're ripped, and little pieces have fallen off everywhere. You feel like this is you sometimes? Everywhere you go, you're just breaking apart. Some of you say, yeah, I feel like my body's doing that because I'm so old now, but your sin does that in your life, and you just, you're falling apart, you're broken, you're ripped along the edges, and this is what you see when you look in the mirror. And then Satan comes along, and he just constantly leads you to live in shame and condemnation. He doesn't miss like I do though sometimes, does he? He hits right home. And I'm glad that I know here there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I know this, but sometimes I don't live this here. And he's stomping you and he's twisting and he's spitting on your life and all you see is condemnation. And then when you fold yourself out, when you pick yourself up, what you see is a massive mess in need of Jesus. Can I get an amen if this looks like you sometimes? But here's what Jesus does. I picked a red book to represent the blood of Jesus. Because when he paid that price for our sin, he was the word. Let this represent Jesus and the word of God. John tells us that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. God became a man. Why? To die and cancel our debt. The wages of sin is death. And Jesus did in three days what we couldn't even begin to do in an eternity in hell. Jesus conquered death. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And so this is Jesus, and here you are. And the beauty of the cross, the beauty of the resurrection, and a reality we've got to get a hold of is Ephesians chapter 1 that tells us we are dead in our trespasses and sin also uses this phrase, in Christ. In Christ. Some ten times, I think, even in the chapter. And he places us inside of him. And he closes the book. Some of you thought this was the book of your sin, didn't you? But... Nope, it's the word that encompasses all of it. And when you look right now, you can't even tell it's there. We're in Christ. Because of Jesus, because of his shed blood, because of the reality of the resurrection, we can become children of God. We are in Christ. He has accepted us. He has enveloped us. He has covered our sin. He has adopted us as his kids because we are in Christ. Not because we could do it, but because he already did. He has made us in Christ. And I love that when I look, I can see just a little crease. I can't see the sin, but I'm reminded of who I used to be. But I'm enveloped and I'm covered. I am in Christ. He conquered death. He canceled my debt of death 
that I could never pay the price for myself. He has made me a part of the family of God. And now when God looks at me, even though I'm still a messed up human being, when God looks at me, he doesn't see the crumpled up mess that's ripped and tattered on the edges. He sees the blood of Jesus that covers and envelops me as a child of God. That is a resurrection reality worth taking home today. Forgiveness. Maybe you're afraid that you're not worthy. Maybe you're afraid that that wouldn't apply to me. I'm going to set you right here to remind you of how your worthiness, where it comes from. You're accepted, not because of your performance, but because of Jesus' perfection. And listen, my friends, because of this reality, look at me for a minute. This is so important. There is nothing you could do to make God love you more. And there's nothing you could do to make God love you less for all of us who are in Christ. Can I get an amen? amen? I'm glad Jesus cuts through our fear. I'm glad that he shows us his love, and I'll show you John 3, 16. Look at this with me. John 3, 16, perhaps you know this verse, but it captures his love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And this is where the condemnation, some of you are letting Satan just stomp you and shame you every day. Verse 17 tells us that for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Verse 18, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already. Jesus didn't come to condemn because we were already crumpled up and condemned to begin with. He came to bring salvation because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. I'm so glad God accepts me as me. He knows all the skeletons in my closet, but while I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. Let me give you number three. We've looked at how Jesus heals pain. That's a great re resurrection reality. We've looked at how Jesus cuts through fear. But number three is that Jesus redeems doubt. How many of you know who Doubting Thomas is? It's doubt is Didymus in the Greek. It means the twin. So I kind of like that, Doubting Didymus. It's a pretty cool name. It's just fun, right? But he redeems doubt. He takes something that is bad and turns it into something that is good. And we see that in Thomas's story. And so Thomas was one of the disciples. And in verses 24 through 29, we see his story. Perhaps you can relate. Verse 24 of John chapter 20. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But here's what Thomas had to say. But he said to them, unless. I wonder what's your unless today. Just a food for thought. Thomas said, unless I see his hand, in his hands, the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side. This is a big statement. I will never believe. This verse is the skeptic's verse. How many of you are that person? You're the one that always says, prove it. Show me the proof, the verifiable evidence. How many of you are raising that little person right now? Our kids are asking a lot of tough questions. And one of the most recent ones, they, they said, Dad, tell me how, how do you know that, that God has always been? Like before the world, how do we know? What, like what did God do? And, and here's the qualifier. They said, and don't say he just always was. <laughs> yeah, good question. Prove it. Prove it to me. And Thomas is just that. Let's go to the next verse. Eight days later. I love that. How many of you are waiting on God to show up? And God always seems late. Jesus' timing, though, is not their timing. Eight days later, he waited until they were gathered again. That's a long time to live in this. But I'm thankful that even when he delays, by my definitions, he's not denying me from truth. He's not denying me from who he is. And he proves that here. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again. And Thomas was with them. He wasn't going to miss church this time. Although the doors, again, were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you for the third time. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Put out your hand and place it in my side. And do not disbelieve, but believe. Verse 28, Thomas answered. I love his answer. He says, My Lord and my God. The Bible doesn't say if he actually touched him. I'm imagining maybe he probably did. Maybe he didn't even feel he needed to. But all we know is that he said, my Lord and my God. And this Thomas, who we know is doubting Thomas, uh, there's debate on where he ended his life. Some think in modern-day Iran. Some think in modern-day India. I, probably in India would make sense as we look at his, the course of his life and history. But he died a martyr. From this moment on, doubting Thomas became courageous Thomas. And he gave his life for this Jesus who he said, unless... Unless, then I will never 
faithfully. Jesus met him in his unless. And then verse 29, Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? I would imagine he probably said, why, yes, absolutely. How could I not, right? But then Jesus says, blessed are those, this is us, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Today, as we look at the response of Thomas, I'm reminded of the future, and maybe this will be a reminder for you. Revelation chapter 4 and verse 11 has the same terminology that Thomas used. Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. And Jesus says, blessed are those of you who believe And even though you haven't seen. And here's what I want to tell you. A lot of times we think that faith, we equate faith. If I'm going to have faith, that means I can't have doubt. It means I can't have fear. Sometimes we think it means we can't even have pain. We put on a church smile. Everybody show your best church smile. That's the one you put on even though you had the knockdown drag out fight on the way here. You put it on so everybody thinks you got it all together, right? We all do it. We think we can't have realities like that in our life. And we certainly can't have doubt. And we think faith is predicated on disappearing doubt. But to that, I would say, have you read about Thomas? Because God used his doubt and built on it to do something special. Here's what I'll tell you. Faith is not the absence of doubt, fear, or pain. Faith is trusting Jesus even when there is doubt, even when there is pain, even when there is fear. Because Jesus heals pain. He cuts through our fear, and he redeems our doubt to bring us to places of belief and of trust and of faith that we could never have had we not gone through that stuff, had we not had those doubts. Now, doubt shouldn't be a dead end. You shouldn't live there. But you should let God enter your doubts just like Jesus entered that room and allow him to redeem your doubts, bring about truth into those big question marks in your head. Let the mysteries of God be just that, to know that I'm not going to know everything about my God, but what I can know is that I can always trust him. He's always trustworthy, even though there may not be an absence of fear, doubt, or pain. Here's what I'll end our time with. I love the picture of different people in this passage. In John chapter 20, you see Mary. She was a problem solver. She went wanted to be as close to Jesus, even if it was just his dead body, as close as she could possibly be. That was her method for grieving. Have you noticed we all grieve differently? We all hurt differently. We're all wired differently. Well, so there was Mary Magdalene. The disciples who had left her there went and kind of had their small group time, their group therapy, their little bit of a church gathering where they gathered together as the body of Christ, all different but fine ways of going about this. Then there's Thomas who didn't show up to church. He went and isolated himself and built skeptical, uh, became skeptical. And then I'll point you to another one, a picture of Cleopas and his companion. Say that five times fast. Luke chapter 24, he was going on the road to Emmaus away from Jerusalem. So while Mary leaned in, the disciples gathered together, Thomas isolated and became skeptical, he ran away. They ran away from the problem. I don't know where you fit, but there's a common denominator. Don't miss this. There's a common denominator. This is a resurrection reality. It is that they all grieve differently. They all had doubts differently. They all process fear differently. But the common denominator was that Jesus showed up that Jesus met them in their fear, in their doubts, and in their pain. And Jesus wants to do the same thing for you and for me. This is a resurrection reality worth living out, trusting a Jesus who not only conquered death, but meets us where we are. But even though he meets us where we are, we say it at Blackhawk, he meets us where we are, but he doesn't leave us there. He changes everything. And I'm glad to know a Jesus who changes everything. The last couple of verses, John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. Verse 31, but these are written, why? For us, why? So that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his I want to ask you to bow your heads, ponder what does that mean for you to be in Christ, to be enveloped in the Word who became flesh, who took on your sin, nailed it to the cross, and conquered the grave. If you're a believer today, what does it mean to know the resurrection reality is that Jesus heals your pain, cuts through your fear, and even meets you in and redeems your doubts for His glory? How can you bring that to the table today? How can you trust Jesus in a new way today? For some of you here, you're here today and 
God has brought you here just for this sole purpose, that you would hear the gospel. You've been trying to live your life your way. You've been trying to achieve salvation on your own merit, on your own good works, or on the backs of the, the faith of those who have gone before you. But today the gospel is very clear that Jesus lived the sinless life you could never live. Jesus died to pay a price for your sin that you could never pay. He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing while he hung on the cross. He thought of you. He thought of this very moment. And he rose from the dead to conquer death, hell, and the grave. And because he lives, I don't just get to face tomorrow. I get to have eternal life today and be a child of God. And for some of you, the Holy Spirit is just drawing your heart right now. Whether in the room, sitting somewhere, watching on a screen, you just know the Spirit is moving you don't need a prayer to save you. It's your heart to save you. Some of you need to nail that down. You've been questioning it, pondering it, meaning to get to it. Nothing is more important than this decision of what are you going to do with Jesus? It's the greatest resurrection question of all time. Will you trust him? I'm going to lead you in a prayer today if you need some help, but let this just be from your heart to God. Just say, Lord Jesus, I need you to save me. I believe you died on the cross for my sin, paying my debt. I believe you rose again, that you're alive today. I ask you to save me and forgive me. I give you me, all of me. I trust in you and nothing else to save me. If that's you today as believers are praying what it means to be in Christ, would you pray, cry that out to the Lord in your own words. Give your heart to him in this moment. Don't wait another second.